for today, we should be uh, talking about scalars, vectors, and tensors. So this is really kind of a mathematical background for how you describe various physical properties using these different mathematical objects. So what are scalars? We do know plenty of physical quantities that can be described by scalars. And typically at this point, I want, I, I do ask the students to give me some examples. So I'm pretty sure that uh, these things such as temperature, density, mass density, heat capacity, energy formation uh, is quite clear examples of what do we mean by scalar physical properties. Can you think about anything else, any other scalar quantity? Anyone from you? It takes time to hear your answers. So for example, time would be a scalar. Mass, for example. Sorry? Mass. Mass, very good, very good, very good, yeah. Um, so all of these, mass, time, pressure, all of these would be scalar quantities. Sometimes you would think also about other properties which are typically given to us as numbers, thermal expansion, resistivity, or Young's modulus. And what we should actually learn during this course is that none of these last three ones is a scalar. It, these are either vectors or tensors um, or some other type of quantities. We do need more than just a number in order to describe this physical property. An example of the Young's modulus, which may be probably the least straightforward one to understand is if you take a material and you start loading it in different directions with the same force, you will get probably a different deformation depending on your crystallographic direction of loading. And this is exactly what the Young's modulus describes. It describes the uniaxial loading, also the response to uniaxial loading, so the response of a uniaxial force in terms of the deformation induced in this direction. But of course, I can apply the force in different directions. And in these different directions, I'm likely to get a different deformation different contraction or extension of my sample. And therefore, for the, same, uh, for the same sample, for the same specimen, the Young's modulus depends on the direction of loading, apart from many other things that it might be uh, positionally dependent, right? I might not have a homogeneous material, and some parts might be stiffer, some might be uh, softer, but even in the stiffer or softer part, if I then take this very local point in the space and I load it in different directions, I'm going to get a different response. And so then the Young's modulus is a very uh, funny quantity. It's actually neither vector nor tensor in this uh, easy terminology because it is a quantity which depends both on the vector of application as well as on the position where we are in the space. So what are these colors? How do we define them? And now... Something happens. You still hear me, but you don't see anything, right? Yes, yes we can hear you, but also your video is stuck. I see. That is because my tablet is frozen. So let's see what comes out of that. In the worst case, I get disconnected and have to connect again. Let us see. Exactly this slide that makes a bit of problem uh, in my app too. A good reader can read it, but it takes some time. I see. I think that's because the image which is right here is way too big. 
probably I should re-optimize it. So if I do that, I'll upload these lecture notes once again to Moodle, right? But now you hear me again and see me. Yes, everything fine. Everything fine. Back to the real world. Okay. So the scalar quantity, or physical quantity, is a, a number, is a single number, which then, of course, depend on the uh, position in the space, which can depend on the time, can be time dependent, positionally dependent. But for each uh, pair of time and position, I do get a single number, which then completely describes my quantity, my physical property. Right? When we want to talk about vectors, and now intuitively, without necessarily the mathematical background, the mathematical definition, again, we have an example of many vector quantities here from the electric field, current, magnetic field, velocity, force. All of these are vectors, as we learned it in high school physics. Now, what does it mean that these are vectors? For each position in the space and each time, in addition to the magnitude of my physical quantity, I also need to provide a direction in which it points, right? So if I have, for example, uh, a flux which describes a flow of certain material. And at each position in the space and each time, I will need to provide a vector showing direction. And the length of the vector tells me how fast does that element of the whole material, how fast does it flow? I can visualize it using a vector field, as it's shown here on the left-hand side. This would correspond to a two-dimensional material. So I have x and y axis and a single time snapshot. Maybe it's a static field and nothing changes with time, or this is just a snapshot in time, showing that this is the current situation, right? And we then clearly see that the parts which are here in the corners, they have the largest values of the quantity, whatever it is, maybe electric field, maybe magnetic field, maybe flux, who knows. Uh, and in each of these corners, they point in different directions, right? So in order to fully define a vector field, we need to provide for each position and time we need to provide two things. We need to provide the magnitude of that quantity. So this is kind of a scalar and the direction in which it points. These two together, magnitude and the direction, define a vector. So what is, what is a vector and how do we specify? Right? It's very easy if we are in the lecture room. I show my hands and I say, this is the initial point, this is the end point, and the vector goes from my right hand to my left hand. This is a vector, right? Um, well, I can do it with some difficulties, but I can still do it here during our online lecture. But what if I was writing you an email, right? I'm very unlikely going to uh, make there a photograph of myself and saying, a the vector points from my right hand to my left hand. I'm more likely going to say that consider a vector which has uh, a certain component. And in order to provide you with these components to be able to uh, put down the components of the vector, I need to define a coordinate frame. So what I will do in the first place is I will consider a Cartesian coordinate frame. This is something which is most commonly used, which is most intuitive, most simple, and in many cases, it will suffice for us. So Cartesian coordinate system in three dimensions, where we normally live, uh, is given by three vectors. These 
are three uh, basis vectors, x1, x2, and x3, uh, define the directions of the three axes. And also they define the length units along these directions. Okay, so then if I want to provide you with the vector A, I want to specify it really, I can simply provide you with three scalar numbers, these A1, A2, and A3, which are the length, in fact, A1, A2, and A3, are the length of the vector projections of the vector A into the direction of the vector x1, x2, and x3. So what I do have here actually a little bit inaccurately written is a vector A1, vector with this arrow. So in fact, then I should write here that this is A1 vector, and this equals to A1, which is the length time times the vector x1. Okay. So x1 defines the direction and the length unit. And then I say a1 is five times the vector x1. So I know how to come from uh, my origin to the end of the vector x, uh, a1. In order to specify then the vector, I can provide the three scalar numbers, these coordinates. But the coordinates are not sufficient just on themselves. What I need to provide as well is the information in which coordinate frame do I specify them. Because I can choose, I'm a free man, I can choose another coordinate frame as it's written here with these prime axes, x1 prime, x2 prime, and x3 prime. They are again Cartesian coordinate system. That means all these uh, three vectors are perpendicular to each other and the unit length along each of these axes is still one. And still the projections of the vector A, which is uniquely defined, they simply exist in the space, the projections will be different. They will be given as it's written here with this uh, variables x, uh, a1 prime, a2 prime, and a3 prime. And so that means that I can provide different coordinates describing the same vector just by choosing a different coordinate frame. Of course, if they do describe the same vector, they must be related somehow. And the relation is done by the relation of the coordinate systems. If I know how to come from one coordinate frame into another one, that means I do know how to translate coordinates in one coordinate frame to the coordinates in the other coordinate. This translation is done mathematically by expressing the vector A in the two different coordinate frames, which is always the same mathematically, the same linear combination of the basis vectors, right, leading to the three coordinates a1, and here we have the three coordinate a primes. These are related to each other. By knowing the old coordinates or the unprimed coordinates, I can obtain the new coordinates. This relationship, this translation is called a transformation matrix. And the transformation matrix is fully determined by the mutual relationships between the basis vectors in the primed coordinate frame expressed in the unprimed coordinate frame. The matrix relationship, as it's written here, when we have a vector given here by this three by one matrix and the transformation matrix, 
three by three matrix can be written in a simplified form also using the sum. So each of the primed coordinates is simply the uh, matrix multiplication. So we get the row times the column of these, uh, of these old coordinates. And in a simplified form, we can write it also using so-called Einstein's summation rule, which we will be using here later on very extensively and will simplify many of the uh, expressions. What does it mean? Whenever we see in an equation on the same side of the equation, a repeating index, and the index is there exactly twice then we assume a summation over this repeating index over all dimensions. So in other words, in this expression, we are summing over index i. You see the index i repeats here twice, exactly twice. And that means that we can write it without explicitly writing the sum here. And we just come to this simplified expression uh, aj prime equals now the transformation matrix aj i times the old coordinate a i. The summation, this Einstein summation will simplify some of our expressions. For example, uh, you can use it very conveniently to write the matrix multiplication. Each of these components of the resulting matrix is obtained as a multiplication of a given row and a given column. Right? So this is the row, this is the column. I assume you know how to multiply matrices. So this one would be this row and this column. Right? Good. Uh, of course, then each of these components of the matrix C can be written using this uh, sum, which just says that for I's row and J's column, we need to multiply exactly the I's row of the first matrix and the J's column of the second matrix and sum over the uh, all of these pair products. So we end up with the sum over the third index K. And that we can write using the Einstein summation rule simply in this form. Okay? So we see here this repeating index, and that will be a sign for us that there is actually a summation. And then if you should, for example, multiply four matrices, that means sum over many different indices, you can imagine and you will very soon see that this uh, rule, this uh, sort of notion uh, helps us to simplify significantly the expression, how it's written on the paper. Some properties, reminder of the uh, matrix algebra, linear algebra. We know that the matrix multiplication is not commutative and therefore also the order of the indices that we write them matters. So what do I mean by that? If this corresponds to a certain matrix and this, corresponds to the transposed matrix. When I change the order of the indices, I do change the meaning of what is row, what is column, which is exactly the transposition of a matrix. The same way for the multiplication, uh, you can well, you can imagine it here by multiplying this vector. Uh, probably work out that example very quickly yourself. Uh, and also, it is it, it does matter whether then I write if C I J equals I A K B K J, or whether if I would write 
it a k i e k j okay obviously this is not the same thing in general because what i do have here in fact is a transposed and then k r uh, sorry i k i k and only now i would see this as a matrix multiplication because i do have the repeating in this index uh, next to each other in the first matrix it corresponds to the uh, this repeating index to the different columns in the second matrix it corresponds to the uh, individual rows and then i can see that this corresponds to a transposed times b whereas this corresponds to a times b matrix okay so i can get completely different result completely different meaning just by changing the order of the index indices be careful about it some properties of the transformation matrix if i have a transformation matrix between two cartesian systems then the resulting transformation matrix is orthonormal what does it mean firstly its determinant equals to one secondly the inverse matrix is simply the transpose matrix. Now, what does this mean? This is the mathematical definition that probably you have seen and you have learned in linear algebra. We should provide this also with some physical insight. So firstly, if I have in general a determinant, uh, uh, in general a transformation matrix A, and I calculate its determinant. Do you know how to interpret this number? What can one imagine under such a number? I will give you an example. Right? Let us try following two coordinate frames. The first one, and I'll do it in 2D. First one has x1, this one, and this is x2. Then I take another coordinate frame in which I have x1 prime, this one, and this is x2 prime vector. All right, and we take such an object. This object is in the green coordinate frame, has length A1 and A2, where A2 equals one and A1 equals also one. So in the green coordinate system, the volume equals one. In the blue coordinate system, A2 prime, equals still one but a1 prime equals two right so the volume in the blue coordinate system equals two now if you want to calculate the coordinates uh, the, the transformation matrix what would be the transformation matrix in this case a equals well we provide the coordinates in the old coordinate system and we want to get it in the new one means it will look simply like this that means if i provide coordinates a1 a2 and i multiply it by this matrix a and i get the coordinates in the new coordinate system a1 prime a2 prime what is the determinant of the matrix a Anyone knows? Two. Two, exactly. So what is now the meaning of this two? The determinant tells us how do we scale the volumes? So if I have a volume expressed in the green coordinate system, then 
I take this green coordinate system volume. Now the colors. So I take the if I if I want to get the blue coordinate system volume, I get that this equals determinant of the transformation matrix times the volume in the green coordinate system. So the determinant of the coordinate matrix says, how does the volume change from being expressed in coordinates in one in a coordinate frame into another one? And obviously, if we take two Cartesian systems, which have the same unit length, that's our definition of the Cartesian system, then the volume does not change when I come from one to another one. Right? So the Cartesian the, the, uh, coordinate transformation between two Cartesian systems corresponds only to rotation. That's beautiful. Now, the second property that we have here, inversion matrix equals transformation uh, transposed matrix. What does actually an inverse matrix mean? Inverse matrix corresponds to the inverse transformation in this case. So if A describes the transformation from old coordinate system to a new one, from the unprimed to the primed coordinate system, then A, A inverse A describes the opposite, the inverse transformation from the primed to unprimed. So um, what is this? All right, so if we have a j prime equals a j i a i, then a i equals a i j minus one a j prime. Inverse transformation, everything's the opposite. I go from unprimed to primed using matrix A, and I go from pro un from unprimed. Sorry, I go from primed to pri unprimed, too many similar words, from primed to unprimed using the inverse matrix. Okay. And the Cartesian coordinate system has this beautiful relationship that this inverse transformation is simply expressed by matrix, which is also a transpose matrix. So that means that this second line I can write as AI equals, and now I put here the transpose matrix. So AJ prime. Why? Because AIJ minus one equals A transposed by J, which is, and now the transposition changes the order of the indices, right? Again, please do not forget that in all of these expressions that we have here, we silently assume the sums there, right? The Einstein summation, everywhere there is a sum. So this is what we have just done and you probably have it on your uh, lecture notes, hopefully, right? Just do not be confused here with the fact that the indices here and indices here are exactly the same order. That does not mean that the same matrix describes the transformation from primed, unprimed to primed, as well as from primed to unprimed, no. The second line, this last line, is actually not a matrix multiplication in the sense as above. Right? We do have the indices, which is repeated, but this is not a matrix multiplication. This is not a matrix A times a vector, because we are summing here over all different columns in this matrix times always all the same, uh, all, all the components of the vector A, right? So this would be A1 prime. 
for example. Is this clear to you? Might be a little bit confusing, I admit, but please note this, okay? So we need to care about the repeating in the sys, but not only that they are repeating, but also about their position, about their order, in order to see a matrix multiplication. I do have here a simple example again to show you how things work. Um, exactly. The whole derivation you can do yourself. Okay. It is a, a simple math and simple uh, trigonometry that you need to apply here in order to express what are the coordinates of the same vector, in this case, the, the vector v in uh, the primed coordinate system, known the coordinates in the unprimed. So these are the coordinates in the unprimed coordinate system. And then we multiply them. So actually, this would be the unprimed coordinates. And then we multiply them by a transformation matrix to get the coordinates in the primed coordinate system. Okay? These expressions here. They are a simple trigonometry, I believe, from the high school or math 101. Figure them out if you need to uh, know what, uh, how these were obtained. But now look at this, right? This is where mathematicians would end, basically. You have the expression, you know the matrix multiplication, and you are done. But now you look at it as a physicist, and you actually can see a little bit more. If you say that this is a matrix that corresponds to a change of the coordinate system, which has been rotated by angle phi, you do it this way. Now, what do you expect? If you would go in the opposite direction, r minus phi, well, then you are actually going the inverse transformation. So this, in our case, should be the inverse, inverse matrix to the original rotation anticlockwise phi. So if this is an anticlockwise rotation by angle phi, this is an anticlockwise rotation. That's the opposite, the inverse transformation. But we know that this can be expressed also by assuming simply the angle minus phi for our original expression. This is the physical interpretation of it. And so if you now put all of this together, you will actually indeed come to this conclusion, what we have just said. Moreover, you will now be able to figure out that this inverse matrix, inverse transformation, which is simply the rotation of the inverse angle minus angle is the transposed matrix for the plus phi angle rotation so out of here out of this juggling with matrices you do not prove the expression that inverse matrix is the same thing as transposed matrix for transformation between orthonormal coordinate systems but you provide here a one specific example showing that this really works, right? Again, distinguish between proving, that means showing that this works for all types of matrices and showing an example that it works. Here we showed one particular example with a beautiful physical insight of the meaning simple rotational matrix where we know how to interpret the individual components we know how what to expect uh, we know what is the parameter phi that this is uh, just a rotational angle. so uh, if it's juggling with the indices before and with this uh, relationship between inverse and transformation matrix was a bit unclear in its general terms I do hope that with this specific example, it becomes clear how it can work.
So let us try to make one step further. We've spoken a lot about scalars, which are single numbers, about vectors, which are magnitude of the quantity plus its vector. Now let us think about potential physical laws. Here we have an example of Ohm's law, which puts together the electric field and the electric flux. And typically, we would learn it in this form. Not, well, maybe sometime or, or more often the first time we see it in the integral form, right? This uh, resistivity times current equals the voltage. We can see it also in the differential form. And those of you who went or are attending the solid state physics, again, we will see this very often in the first part of the lecture that the uh, flux, the electric current, uh, equals the conductivity times the electric field. Typically, this number is assumed to be a number, is assumed to be a scalar. It means if I have an electric field in a certain direction, the electric flux is in the same direction. It is just rescaled by the conductivity. So if I have material with large conductivity, then for the same electric field, I get a large flux in that direction. If I have material with low conductivity for the same electric field, I get the flux in the same direction, just smaller. Taking here an example of an old publication, 50 years old, uh, where people reported on the electric resistivity which is the inverse of conductivity. So we can talk about electric conductivity of vanadium oxide. And they do not provide a single number here. They do provide here actually two numbers, which might be confusing. Once again, we would be expecting single number whereas they provide here two numbers. What are those two numbers? Although to, those two numbers are actually components, very specific components of a certain matrix of resistivities. And if you then ex, uh, accept this, that a resistivity would be not expressed by a single number, by a matrix of numbers in a given coordinate frame, you would actually end up with a vectorial relationship rewriting the Ohm's law from above into this form. Well, here now we have the vector matrix and vector, which means that the electric flux is not always parallel to the applied electric field. In other words, I get. I choose a certain electric field, meaning its magnitude and its direction. I do get, for two different materials, I might get, of course, that the flux is in the direction of the applied field. And for one material, it's smaller, the flux for the other material is larger. But I also can get two different materials in which the electric flux has the same magnitude Electric flux is the same, but in each case, it goes in different direction. One, for example, it's parallel with the electric field. In the other one, it's tilted. It goes in a direction which is tilted with respect to the direction of the applied electric field. This freedom to have such behavior brings the extension of the conductivity from a single scalar to a matrix in a given coordinate frame, the same coordinate frame in which I'm expressing the vectors of the electric flux and the electric field, or in a more general way, without 
specifying the electric fields. I do have now this vectorial form in which the vector of the electric flux is uh, the tensor of the conductivity times the vector of the electric field. This is so-called second rank tensor. The second rank corresponds to the fact that in the coordinate frame, I'm expressing this physical quantity with two indices. I might have quantities which need three, four, or more indices. Then I would have third, fourth, or higher order tensor. Okay. So in fact, saying this, we can think about scalars and the vectors also as part as tensors. We can say that scalars are zeroth order, zeroth dimensional tensor, zeroth rank tensor. Vectors would be the first rank tensors of one first dimension, one dimensional tensors. Second rank tensors in this hierarchy going from a number to a vector, which is in three dimensions, three times one matrix. The second rank tensors are then expressed in three dimensions by three by three matrices. If we would be describing properties of two dimensional material, graphene, for example, then the conductivity and other physical properties would be second rank tensors in two dimensions, meaning that they would be described by a two by two matrix. So the number here correspond to the, these numbers, they correspond to the dimensionality of our program. Whereas their number, the fact that we have three by three matrix corresponds to the rank of the tensor. So in this hierarchy, if we go from second rank tensors to nth rank tensor in three dimensions, they would be in general described by three to the power of n components, which can be understood as nth dimensional matrix. So if I would have a third rank tensor, which is essentially a three by, uh, a three, by three by three matrix, it means it's a cube of data. Right? So this is how I can imagine a third rank tensor, the Rubik cube. A fourth rank tensor is in fact a matrix, which is three by three. And in each of its components, we have again a three by three matrix. So in order to get to a specific component, we need to specify first the indices of the big matrix, which would be two numbers each of them going from one to three. And then another two numbers inside of this matrix specifying the position there. So overall, I would need four indices. So this is the fourth rank tensor expressed in a certain coordinate system. I will leave this slide for you to try to do it at home. It's a nice and simple exercise in linear algebra of and, and a bit of juggling with the indices. What are we trying to do here is following thing. We assume two different coordinate systems, unprimed and primed coordinate system. Of course, the physics must be the same in both of these, right? We are describing the same material, the same relation between electric field and electric flux. The fact that we describe the electric field as a vector is related to our chosen coordinate system. The fact that I do not tell you this is a vector, but I do give you three components of the vector, 
means that I've chosen a certain coordinate system. In the first line here, it's the unprimed coordinate system. And so I use the same coordinate system to express electric field, electric flux, and also the corresponding conductivity. Then I choose change the coordinate system to the primed one. And again, I have the same mathematical relation, just with different numbers, electric field primed, electric flux primed, and the conductivity primed. Good. Now I know how the transformation works for vectors. So I can translate the vector from primed to unprimed coordinate system. I can translate the electric field from primed to unprimed system. Consider here, that this is actually the AKJ transposed, which is a minus one KJ for the um, Cartesian coordinate system transformations, right? Good. Now we enter these two expressions into the first expression in the, into the Ohm's law in the unprimed coordinate system. And we work out with these equations. So we are trying now to express the primed flux and primed electric field using the unprimed conductivity. We know also from this second line that then when we come finally to this expression, that this factor of proportionality is the conductivity expressed in the primed coordinate system. So from these two last lines, it must follow that the primed components of the conductivity tensor are related to the unprimed components of the conductivity tensor and uh, then multiplied by two transformation matrices here. So this is our final expression that we have here. And please do not forget that in fact here, we have a sum over which indices? Anyone? Over index M and index K. Let me just check if you are still here. Okay, there is someone here, that's good. So we have the summation over these two indices M and K. Is any one of you able to tell me whether this simply means that we have two matrix multiplications or just one matrix multiplication exactly in the form that we see it here? What do you think? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Good. Uh, I was just, just worried that maybe I, I lost the connection. So um, this actually, if you look at it, let's have a look at this part. So we have here AIM, Sigma MK, AJK. Of course, since this is the sum and in the sum, of products in each product. These are, these are just numbers, right? These are components of matrices. And we know that the number product, multiplication of numbers is commutative. So three times two is the same as two times three. Not so for matrices, but for numbers, the multiplication is commutative. So in this expression, in the coordinate expression, I can change the order how I write them as I can. We also know that the uh, multiplication and 
uh, summation are associated. It means that I can first uh, express the sum, which is here over m and k. I can write it as sum over k. And here I have sum over m, a i m sigma m k times a j k. And now if you look at this inner form in a sum that we have here, this looks like matrix multiplication. We have a repeating index and the indices are next to each other. That means the first matrix would go over the different columns, whereas the second matrix goes over the different rows. So this is matrix multiplication. Good. That means that as a result of this, we get some matrix with indices i, k. Now we focus on the outer sum that we have there, sum over k. And now we have b, i, k times a, j, k. Right, so we have repeating index. Means in fact, we do not need to write the sum. Sum is there. Uh, not necessary when we assume the Einstein summation rule, but it does not correspond to a matrix multiplication because the indices are ne not next to each other. They are on the other sides. So I would need to write this as B I K times A K J transposed matrix, All right? And so what do I get now? is that actually this is really a component of the matrix B, uh, so B matrix times A transposed matrix, and we have the IJ's component of it. So if I now put everything together, we are saying that sigma it's a matrix and its IJ's component is actually a matrix times sigma matrix times a transposed matrix. And out of here, we take the AJ's component. So in other words, in the vectorial form, we would get a, I'm sorry, I missed the prime here. So sigma prime equals a, times sigma times A transposed. Whereas for the vectors, we had in vectorial form E prime equals A times E. Of course, this is a vector, right? So that means while for the vectors, we needed one transformation matrix because it was the first rank tensor for the Conductivity, which is a second rank tensor, we need two matrices. And the multiplication here goes in a very special order uh, that sort of the tensor, the conductivity is surrounded by the transformation matrices. One of them is the transformation matrix, the other one is the transform, a transposed transformation. So a quick note about the difference between transformation matrices and second rank tensors. Both of them are expressed in coordinate systems with three by three matrices in three dimensions. The huge difference is the transformation matrix relates to coordinate systems. It does make sense only when I say this is a transformation between two coordinate systems. A dictionary does not make sense if I do not specify between which languages it provides the translation. The matrix that corresponds to a tensor is a matrix three by three, but it's related to only a single coordinate system, right? Three by three matrix describing a 
conductivity must be related to the coordinate system in which I expressed the components of this tensor. The tensor, if it's a physical property, then it reflects the crystal asymmetry. That means that if I have a cubic system, then the properties, physical properties along x, y, and z directions must be the same. Whereas the three by three matrix, the transformation matrix can be arbitrary. I can take transformation between uh, Cartesian systems without actually uh, taking into account any crystal symmetry. Good. And I have here at the very end an example of physical quantities, which are uh, described by different ranks of the tensors. Um, I will put it here very quickly. We start with that next week. What I want to show here is that the rank of the tensor is essentially related to the number of indices you have when you express this quantity in a particular coordinate system. At the same time, when you have a physical property which relates different states of the material, then the rank of this property is a sum of the ranks of the state variables. So whereas temperature here, for example, is a zeroth rank tensor, it's a scalar quantity, and the strain is a second rank uh, tensor. Two plus zero is two, and therefore the thermal expansion is a second rank tensor. This will be our ultimate uh, rank, uh, ultimate tensor to which we want to come, which ranks the stress, the second rank tensor, and strain, the second rank tensor, with the matrix of elastic constants, which will be the fourth rank.